Hey guys, this is Kribben Govinder from the Gut Health Gurus podcast. I've got a background in food science. My sidekick colleague right next to me, James Shadrach, has got a background in psychology with a deep interest on the gut and brain, which is an absolutely hot topic when we talk about yes. mental health and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I've got a really interesting fellow for you today. He's, his name is Keith Bell. And he's got this really fascinating group called the the Gut Club on on the on the Facebooks, and he's also got a very interesting group where they look at stool analysis. And so I thought it'd be a great exercise to get Keith onto the podcast because he's got some pretty insightful information coming through his group on especially the stool analysis side, but then he's got some other projects that he's working on. So Keith, how about we get it from the horse's mouth? Who is Keith Bell? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here um, today. It's, it's an honor to be here. I've been, uh, been following uh, what you're doing there and, and I'm completely with you on a lot of uh, topics. Um, but who am I? I'll tell you right now, I'm 9,715 miles away from you in, in Florida <laughs> where the sun is going down. And, um, and you're, what, right outside of Melbourne, Australia? Is yeah, that right? absolutely. And, uh, and that's, um, wow, it's amazing that, that we can be connected here. What is it, about a little after 9 a.m. there now? Is that right? Yeah, just it's in, it's in the morning here. I think it's just after 7 p.m. there. And, and yeah. I should, I should, I should. You know, an absolute honor to have you, Keith, and I, I, you know, sincere thanks for coming on and having a chat with us. So, yeah, keep, keep going. Thank you very much. Um, well, you know, the internet is an amazing thing for us to have this conversation over 9,700 miles away, but one thing I like to do is put things in perspective, and that is that only half the world, I believe that's, uh, that's the current um, percentage, only half the world has internet access. So we really have our work cut out for us when it comes to um, having conversations uh, on a global scale, because most people uh, don't have this way of communicating or they don't have this, uh, this way of being educated. Mm. Um, so, and there's so much to learn on the internet. We're, we're putting out a lot of information about gut health and gut brain health in particular on the gut club Facebook page. And we have a, uh, um, our page on the internet is thegutclub.org. Um, but the group that you're talking about, we have about 3,500 people now on our um, closed group Facebook page. And that is called the Gut Club Stool Test Discussion Group. Mm-hmm. And Kevin, thank you much. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining uh, the group. And, and um, you've been providing some good input too. It's really all about all about um, people posting their microbial DNA stool test results. And as you know, there are so many different types of tests. We focus on a, uh, on a few um, in particular, but we're able to look at these charts and um, analyze them. And, and really we're pioneers in this regard because I think it's safe to say that most doctors wouldn't understand fully how to look at a, at a stool test chart and, and analyze it for imbalance mm-hmm. and, and really know what to look for. Mm-hmm. And, if, and if I were completely honest, I would say that it's open for me too. Um, there's so much to learn about it and to interpret. Um, in fact, one of the things I've been adding to my knowledge base in order to more accurately look at these results is ancestry because mm-hmm. there are a few um, very, you know, amazing ancestry studies showing the differences in, in microbiome. What are your, tell me, what, what's your ancestry, Kribben and, and James? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For, for me, I was born in South Africa. So my family originally came probably three, three to four generations. So my great grandfather was from South India and they essentially during the, I guess the, the, the British, conquest of India, they sent a lot of, and South Africa, they sent a lot of, I guess, indentured labor from India to South Africa. So my 
So my ancestry is essentially South Indian, but with roots in South Africa, really. I identify myself with South Africa probably probably as my ancestry, but obviously now I'm an Aussie, so <laughs> being in Australia. Yes. yes. James, do you have similar ancestry? Yeah, it's, it's similar. Um, so my dad uh, is from Singapore and he has Indian ancestors. And then he came yeah. to Australia and met my mum and she's half Australian and half Greek. So a bit of a mix. Okay. Mm. Well, it's somewhat, it's somewhat serendipitous that you both have some, um, some Indian ancestry mm -hmm. because the studies are showing that uh, India, um, and, and by the way, this is, can also be divided by uh, region in India, but the population in India has a different microbial balance than say one in uh, North America. And the difference being, um, it seems that there, are, there could be higher levels of a gram negative bacteria known as Bacteroides. Yeah. And you know, there are, there are two main groups of, of bacteria that, we, that, we're, that we're looking at in these stool test results. We have the Firmicutes and the Bacteroides. Mm -hmm. And in most countries are dominated by uh, the Firmicutes. But some including, some, including Spain and, and India, some parts are, are actually dominated by, by Bacteroides. So I like to think of this as really the underlying beauty of diversity that yeah. we're talking about here and how this has been um, really developing over thousands of years based on geography um, and, and diet, um, yeah, totally. environmental, environmental factors. Um, I'll, 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 I'll side note there a little bit, and I'll, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, Keith, as well. So when we... When we do analysis here in Australia, because we, we, do, we do gut stool testing through allele microbiome, so the results that we see, if someone has a high bacteroides level, or bacteroidetes, I should say, at the phylum level, yeah. they tend to be more the obese cohort that have that high level. So it, it, just, it just shows, you know, you look at some studies to say that is our formicities a driver of you know, being overweight, but then we see the opposite in some cases with obese people. So what's your thoughts on that? That's a fantastic insight. Um, well, you know, we're seeing a lot of people uh, in, the, in the group that are dominant in bacteroides. And um, when you look at the studies, uh, based on their ancestry, they shouldn't be. And, and the symptoms are, are showing up. And you know, what this probably gets down to is how our immune response is guided by microbes. And in fact, you know, this all takes place in parts of the intestine. You know, it's said that 78%, 70 to 80% of our immune system is in our gut. Um, and if you wanna zero in on the location in the gut where that's taking place, um, it's known as Peyer's patches. And, um, and, you know, there are studies that show that, for instance, lactobacilli are different in how they guide immune response there um, in the Peyer's patches compared to Bacteroides. Um, and, um, you know, you know this, this is my theory uh, regarding vaccine response, actually. Um, you know, people that are dominant in bacteroides may have a hyperactive immune response to a vaccination leading to an adverse reaction. We can talk about that a little bit later, but the, the point is people are different. And, um, you know, you have high levels of gram negative bacteria. How does that relate to obesity? Well, they're producing different types of LPS, mm. um, lipopolysaccharides, but, but you can, put that even through a, a finer tooth comb and um, read the studies that show there are different kinds of LPS, even within Bacteroides um, and completely different types compared to proteobacteria like mm -hmm. E. coli. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we can't just pigeonhole um, LPS in general, but gram negative overgrowth um, is an issue. If you want to look at what might be a healthy, um, balance where gram negative overgrowth might be a natural thing. For instance, it seems that way uh, in populations in Africa and also 
in India, in Spain, possibly in, in Iraq, um, where people were traveling actually, you know, centuries ago to both India and Spain. So mm -hmm. I have, I wonder if, if uh, Persia wasn't the, you know, the cradle of Bactroides, not just the, the cradle of civilization. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's really interesting is that in the Bactroides family is also Prevotella. And that is a, a bacteria that's known to, um, to use, utilize fiber. Uh, and a study came out recently, you may have seen this, it was showing how when people migrate to other countries, um, in fact, it was a study they showed with people from Thailand. Um, it was done out of, uh, out of Minnesota, and uh, where they also have a large Somali community. Um, mm -hmm. And um, they were part of this group. Uh, the Somalis were part of this, this study um, group as well, but they weren't actually studied. It was only the, the Thai people that were studied. And it was shown that when people come to the United States from these countries, they have a, a very distinct flora shift away from Prevotella and um, toward Bactroides. Um, and um, that, you know, that's, that's a mystery as to exactly why that's happening. Is mm. it diet? Um, is, it, um, is it that they're being, uh, well, they're, they're being affected by environmental toxins that they weren't in their home country? Mm -hmm. Could it, you know, it, it could be for many number of reasons. Um, children uh, may have a flora shift based on being vaccinated when they weren't uh, uh, in their home country. Um, so it, what's happening is people are more prone to obesity and uh, hyperactive immune response. When they have that shift away from Prevotella, their natural dominance toward Bactroides, the gram-negative bacteria that that can, it seems to have the ability to cause more trouble. Mm. So let's, let's take a little step backwards and okay. the origin story of the gut, the gut club. Okay. So what, what were you doing, I guess, vocationally at the time when you conceptualized this idea? What, what's your background? Well, my background is really as an environmentalist. I, I have, uh, you know, my view of the gut, is that it's really the maybe the environmental issue of our time? It's you know an environmental issue of the highest order. Sure. Uh, so um, you know, w at the time when I was forming the I idea of of uh, the Gut Club, I had been writing um, articles about the gut and also um, you know leading up to part of the Gut Club, which is our microbiome vaccine safety project, because. I was inspired by a family member that was very ill. It was our dog. Um, back in 2008, she began having a seizure disorder. And um, that's really the inspiration for what we're doing now with the Gut Club as the Gut Brain Epilepsy Project. And James, um, you may have a lot to say about, about this subject um, because only in the last few years at most have we seen new papers coming out explaining uh, the gut origin of seizure activity. And mm -hmm. this is a really important subject because seizure happens to be a, you know, a, really a, a problem, a, problem um, a symptom, I should say, associated with many different illnesses, from MS to Parkinson's to Alzheimer's to autism. They all can incorporate seizure activity. Mm -hmm. um, I think even diabetes. You probably couldn't name um, uh, uh, one of the non-communicable diseases that doesn't have uh, seizure as a symptom. So it was a good way for me to learn about this. I, through tri trials and tribulations, I ended up um, being able to control the horrific seizure clusters that our dog was having. And she, she got sick uh, by swimming in a local lake um, many times that I later found out was sewage contaminated. Yeah. And, then, and then while she was experiencing obvious gut symptoms, she happened to be vaccinated. Um, so that put two and two together for me that there may be a microbial predisposition to an adverse vaccine reaction. Mm. That, that's, that's the construct. So in 2014, I was writing articles in 2015, um, uh, 
and uh, and 2016 started the Gut Club. Um, that that's what happened. So it's been um, it's been a nice journey about three years. But I was pretty prepared to open the doors of the Gut Club, having um, put together a pretty massive file of of studies. All and, you know, I admit I'm, I can be kind of boring to my friends and family um, talking about things from a gut centric standpoint. Most people don't want to talk about microbes the way yeah. I do. Uh, but from, a, from an environmental standpoint, um, it's very exciting. I, last, last year, a friend and I published a, a book. My friend is um, the art teacher at our local high school. He illustrated this children's book about rain-making bacteria. It's, it's called, I Wonder What It's Like to Be a Raindrop. And most, I like to think of it really as an adult book in disguise. You know, it's, it's, it's packaged as a children's book, but any adult reading this, this book to their children um, are going to be, you know, experiencing a surprise because most people have never heard of rain-making bacteria. These no, are the bacteria. You haven't? Oh, no, oh. no, ex please explain. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, you know, rain or snow without bacteria in the clouds. No, These exactly. are special that. bacteria that, that, are, that are on um, plants and in the soil. Please repeat that. Please repeat that part. I think I cut you off. Oh, okay. These these are um, these are special types of bacteria that are on plants and also uh, in soil, and they are wind swept into the atmosphere, mm. where they can enter the clouds, and they have an ability to to turn water into ice right. at very low at very low temperature. And it so happens that 99% of all rain, rain comes from ice clouds. So, you know, it's really factual at this point that we wouldn't have rain or snow without bacteria in the clouds. The higher level clouds can also use um, dust and other um, particulates like um, fungi can also, um, what's, they can perform what's called ice nucleation, where they have the ability to freeze water. Um, there's a, a video on YouTube that shows an experiment. They, they have a, a little tube of water, and uh, they dip um, some tweezers that are coated in bacteria into the water, and immediately it freezes. It's like a magic trick. Oh, my um, God. It's really fascinating. Yeah. So That's there we have Yeah. So from, a, from an environmental standpoint, bacteria are regulating our weather. Um, and also this plays a very large role in climate change because they are holding CO2 in soil and mm -hmm. also, also our oceans. Mm -hmm. so, you know, people think that, that, that climate change is all about fossil fuels. It's nowhere near that simple. In fact, by far, most CO2 is held in, in our environment by microbes. And, and that, plays a role in our bodies as well. You know, if you, you can learn things about the macro and apply it to the micro in our bodies and, and consider things like gases that, that can regulate our brain activity that are, that are really regulated by microbes. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's, a, there's something that most people aren't aware of when it comes to epilepsy. James, this may rock your world. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of um, the um, a breathing method? It's, um, I have a mental block right now in the name of it, but essentially what you do is if someone is having a seizure, you can exhale your breath directly into their nostrils. The ex I'm sorry, it's called the exchange breathing method. Wow. You can, I wish I knew about this while my dog was suffering. Hmm. I, I must have witnessed thousands of, not thousands, but hundreds of seizures, literally, uh, and being helpless, trying everything, like putting an ice pack on her spine and pressing down on her eyeballs and various things that actually did work to halt a seizure. But I wish I would have known about the exchange breathing method and mm. also how CO2 um, as part of our exhalation, when you exhale into the nostrils of a person having a seizure, most of the time they will immediately halt the seizure. Wow. And, yeah. And that is, be, um, you know, no one can really explain that, but my view of that is how the, CO2 and, um, is affecting thing, and also nitrogen is affecting things like nitric oxide sensors, um, 
which impact the serotonergic system, our, our serotonin levels, and that has an impact on the glutamatergic, the excitatory system. And um, you know, I'm sure there's a, a lot more to it that we can go into the details, but the idea is there's this cascade that can take place when you simply exhale into the nostril of someone having a seizure, oh which God. is, yeah, it's an amazing thing. Um, um, there's just recently been a new paper um, where uh, I'm, I'm part of a group on Facebook, uh, even before I started the Gut Club, called Diets for Epilepsy. And mm. they are pioneers in this exchange breathing method. Um, I think what I brought to the table there and also to the table in other epi epilepsy forums uh, on the internet is the idea that we need to focus on the gut. Whereas most um, neurologists are not there yet, they're treating these disorders from the neck up with a cocktail of drugs, um, where the drugs may be effective, um, but most of the time, or you know, maybe half the time, they're not. So they add another drug um, and hope that that works. But it just so happens that a lot of pharmaceutical drugs we're learning are um, really successful when they are by way of the gut. You know, in, well, the quintessential example might be metformin. That's the leading diabetes medication. Yeah. And there are many studies now showing how that um, is affecting uh, the gut micro microbes, doing things like raising acromantia and lactobacilli, yeah. and how that can, can uh, attenuate diabetic symptoms. So... You know, it's an exciting time when you're a gut-centric person connected with the web of life. That's the idea. That's what we're trying to do. Totally. And it isn't it interesting, Keith, that, you know, the, I guess the very, the very early research is we're kind of against bacteria. Like mm -hmm. bacteria was a, a disease-causing agent, but now it's really flipped on its head. And now we're starting to appreciate how important microbes and bacteria yeast fungi parasites all these things are so essential for life and who would have thought james mm. that they're responsible for the weather yeah i mean that is that is just yeah. staggering I, I i'm i'm my jaws hit the floor yeah me too i i think we should um, rejoice in this potential for shattering egos worldwide because mm we need to focus more on what's outside of us uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and what's deep inside of us. Even viruses now are considered to be essential for our balance. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And, and this goes back to uh, um, infancy. In fact, the, in our earliest days as, as babies, it's been shown that viruses outnumber bacteria. And these are, are the phages, you know, the bacteriophages. Uh, the bacteriophages are, are, are targeting particular bacteria and um, keeping them under control. And if we want to um, you know, bring this full circle, we can talk a, a little bit, bit about India and the river Ganges. You know, people yeah. use this river that is so polluted, of course, uh, with, with sewage and who knows what else. It's a toxic river. But for centuries, it's also been known as a medicinal um, source. And people religiously go into uh, the, the ganjas and, uh, and can be healed. There's a, a very you know, eye-opening school of thought that the reason the river is healing is uh, through the viruses that are there, bacteriophages that are coming from the beginnings of the river in the mountains. The, uh, uh, where the snow is melting and, and uh, these viruses are entering the, the river and have healing properties. So mm -hmm. it's a, kind of a form of phage therapy. That's, a, that's such a fascinating thought experiment. And I hope you know, someone listening out there will, will take some of this information on board and hopefully we can see some, mm -hmm. some data on you know, potentially validating this would be really fascinating. Yeah. I, I was, Go ahead, James. I was just going to ask Keith, I'm, I'm really interested to get into, I guess some of the ways people can start to heal themselves through all this information. So I wonder in terms of a person who maybe comes into the gut club and maybe 
they're suffering from some type of gut related issue or maybe some other type of health related issue. What can, what are you starting to learn and what are the group members starting to learn about their guts and their health? Well, that's, that's, that's really zeroing in on, on probably the most important personalized medicine that we're developing. I mean, uh, people are realizing that, that it needs to be personalized. And so when you look at stool test charts, you can see, you know, how someone is different from another person and then start to develop a strategy based on microbial balance and how to bring that into homeostasis. So when we're looking at someone, say, with Bacteroides dominance, um, my theory these days is that a high-dose vegetable diet, uh, similar to the Walls protocol, may be the way to go to, to raise the firmicutes to balance out the, the Bacteroides. That's like nine cup a day vegetable diet. Mm -hmm. um, Terry, Terry Walls, you, you may be familiar with, she yeah. was able to reverse her, her MS. So, and in fact, a lot of autoimmune diseases um, are shown to be high Bacteroides. Type one diabetes um, is high Bacteroides in, in places like Finland. Um, so that, that's one way to, to consider uh, handling that, that type of balance. Mm. But that's not to say that a strict carnivore diet therapeutically or, or a low carb diet also has its function. Um, and in fact, someone with high levels of firmicutes, which are mainly clostridium, may benefit more by that route, by going the route of, of a paleo diet, for instance, mm -hmm. um, in, order, in order to raise bacteroides. In fact, the ketogenic diet is, is known to lower clostridia. Um, these days, ketogenic diet is kind of trendy, and um, pe people that are using that diet are not you know, using the classical ketogenic diet, which is extremely high fat. Yes. It's more like a, more like a paleo low carb diet. Sure. If you're calling, calling the ketogenic diet. Absolutely. I like to, I like to think the ketogenic diet is really not about ketones. It's about flora shift. Mm. Uh, and uh, it, the ketogenic diet itself may be a misnomer. It's, uh, it's, we, we need to come up with a new name for, for that plan. All along, I think the ketogenic diet, which has, roots in, uh, in epilepsy going back, um, gosh, what, 80 years now? Mm. It's, uh, you know, I think all along it's been about flora shift. Mm. Yeah, I, I wonder what you think on the mental health front as well. I know there are some studies that I've looked into where there are differences in the types of bacteria between people who were, uh, I guess, categorized as not having depressive symptoms and then there was another group of people where um, they had, they scored higher on these depressive symptoms and quality of life. And in the study that I'm thinking of, they were missing certain types of bacteria. And we can probably add this in the show notes. The Dalista? Yeah. 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 Was this, one. Is, this is the one. It was a Coprococcus? Yes. Yes. The other one? This is the one. Yeah. Well, there are also some really uh, cool papers that are promoting uh, fiber in order to raise the butyrate producing microbes. Um, I was moved by your recent video, uh, Kriven. You posted it on May 1st, so yep. not even a week ago, um, mm. or just about a week ago, about your background with anxiety. Mm. Um, did you do a stool test um, at that time? Or what? Let's, let's talk about what may have been the mechanism for your uh, return to health. Yeah, absolutely. I think my, my struggle was would have been about eight years ago now. But when I look back, it was a combination of different factors. I would say, looking retrospectively, an extremely high level of stress was one definite kind of obvious glaring kind of highlight. The, the other thing was my diet was very heavy in processed foods. Mm -hmm. at, at the time, I was working for one of the biggest, certainly in Australia, one of the biggest food companies. So as you would when you're working for a food company, you're, you're accessing a lot of their products. So it was extremely processed in nature. What else was the other causative factors? Subsequently, I have tested my stool on numerous. <laughs> I'm probably one of the, the most heavily stooled persons on the planet because 
we have a company with testing stools, so I, I very often send my stool for analysis. Mm -hmm. But it, it was very clear. I was very high in formicutes and probably lacking fiber would be the other, the other thing. So extremely high in processed carbohydrates. Clostridium would also be very high back in those early days. But were they the, um, were they the type of clostridia that are in the clusters that don't produce butyrate? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely not the good, the good type, the, the good okay. clostridials. That, that's for sure. I was very low in, I've always been pretty low in bifidobacteria as well. That's another, another watch out for me being a very important agent for, I guess, the brain production of mm -hmm. tryptophan and things like that. Yeah. And, and certainly not enough sunlight, not enough sunlight and way too much blue light exposure, way too much electromagnetic radiation from Wi-Fi. I think these are all the environmental factors, microbial factors, and also mitochondrial factors that were driving my anxiety and, and depression. And, and also just having, you know, what's really undervalued as well is the impact of, you know, talking about your problems. And there's studies out there that show that co cognitive behavior therapy causes shifts in in the, in the microbiome so it's an axis that works both ways would you agree on that of course yes you know when you in fact an interesting way to think about it is uh, the connection of the vagus nerve uh, from the gut to the brain a lot of people um, may know this already but i still like to repeat it 90 percent of the communication um, on the vagus is from gut to brain mm -hmm. only 10 percent is brain to gut um, mm -hmm. and one of the, th the first thing you, you mentioned is stress. Stress is known to lower protective bacterial counts like bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's a direct you know, brain to gut connection. So of course, I'm a big uh, believer that our emotions are, are a huge factor. Um, um, but going the opposite direction, you can you know, see that we need to have, for instance, adequate levels of lactobacilli um, because they are able to, through the vagus, um, create, uh, pardon me, higher numbers of oxytocin receptors. Mm. And, and from there, you can extrapolate um, higher levels of things like empathy. Um, so, you know, and that's, that's being able to feel things and be connected with the outside world. Yep. In fact, there was a study just came it came out this week. Those people that are um, that are having a greater level of oneness, that's connection to you know an you know an interdependence with the outside world, have higher levels of life satisfaction. Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't give the mechanism for that, but I happen to think it's about you know things like precursors uh, being uh, gratitude, empathy, totally. Oxygen oxytocin and lactobacillus yeah um, <laughs> that, that, that's so interesting that you mentioned oxytocin because when i was at a conference there was a speaker that spoke in length about the impact of oxytocin and shifts in the gut microbiome and you know, speaking to i guess some of her subjects i think there were she was in that sort of autism research field and it's like the child almost can't stand the smell of the mother and they, they can't make eye contact. And I find that so interesting because, you know, even simple things like human touch and eye contact are key drivers for production of, of oxytocin. Mm. So that's, that's really fascinating that you connect that link to, to the gut microbiome as well. Yeah, it is. It's fascinating to me too. And I, I'm not sure if I came up with it independently. Um, there's a researcher uh, by the name of Susan Erdman who's written papers about this. Um, so I may have suspected it and then found uh, confirmation. That's, I, I can't take credit for that. Um, mm -hmm. So here's the, uh, you know, going back to your situation and what pulled you out of, out of anxiety, when, when you, if, if it's true that you had high levels of uh, clostridia, you know, these clostridia are also known to 
regulate levels of serotonin in the gut, gut-derived serotonin. And also, um, there's, there's some evidence uh, that the clostridia are also um, impacting tryptophan synthesis in the gut. So it's not just about dietary tryptophan. Um, so, you know, it may also be that you have high levels of gram-negative bacteria or the clostridia themselves were also degrading um, those precursors, those amino acid uh, precursors like tryptophan and, and uh, other amino acids that, that cross the blood-brain barrier and are the precursors to ner the neurotransmitters mm -hmm. like, ser like serotonin. Because yeah. ser serotonin is produced in the gut, it's, it's actually 95% of all the serotonin produced in the body. But um, what's not so well known is that that cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, it, the, the serotonin that's produced in the brain um, is the product of tryptophan that does cross the blood-brain barrier. And the competing amino acids with tryptophan can guide uh, what, you know, what crosses the blood-brain barrier. So you know, what's not so commonly acknowledged, I think, is that these, these amino acid levels are really both made and broken. They're, you know, they're, they're degraded and synthesized by microbes. And I think we need to put, uh, put that out there for common knowledge because right there you see a, a very powerful gut-brain connection when amino acids are guiding neurotransmitter balance and how that all goes back to the gut. So with your situation, you may have had, if you had a clostridium overgrowth, it's possible that you had too much crossing the blood brain, brain, blood brain barrier leading to something akin to serotonin syndrome where you have high levels of brain serotonin. Everyone seems to think it's about low levels of serotonin. So they, you know, the doctors put people on a, you know, an SSRI, um, mm. where, where the reality may be for some people, they have the opposite problem. Mm. And this can impact the glutamatergic system and cause excitotoxicity and um, even brain cell damage. And, and how that affects um, what are called the cardiac vagal neurons that regulate our heart beat. So there's, there's actually a gut brain heart connection. And that is studied in, in relationship to uh, sudden infant death syndrome um, and also um, sudden uh, death by seizure, pseudo. Um, so that, that gut brain heart connection is, is something I'm still learning about. It's, it's you know, a powerful construct, I think, to explain, you know, especially SIDS, which is a, an excruciating problem. Absolutely. Now, how do we, Keith, how do we, how do we, I guess, provide some, some actionable, I guess, recommendations for the lay audience that perhaps might be struggling with a mental health issue like anxiety or depression? How do we kind of wrap this into some nice recommendations that you have to, to optimize your mental health using this information? Well, what did you do to change your diet? Uh, what, did, how did you, what do you attribute your, your comeback to? Were you eating a lot of greens by chance? I, I, I actually stumbled across the work of Natasha Campbell McBride and the GAPS diet. So I followed the GAPS diet strictly for around, from memory, it was around four months. Very strictly. So you, were, so hmm? you were making your own kefir, right? Yeah, and I started making my own kefir to introduce fermented foods. And I also, it, was, it wasn't only the way I felt that was so substantial, it was the weight loss, you know, I was extremely overweight at the time, probably a good 14, 15 kilos heavier than I am now. And it was, it was a transformation from, from a mental health perspective and from a physical perspective as well. Mm -hmm. that, those were the, the, the two kind of most glaringly obvious changes that I made really clean diet, not much carbohydrates, not much things like anything that was FODMAPs. I was pretty much taking it out. Were you eating, were you eating uh, potatoes and rice and grains? I, I pretty much, that was eliminated out as well during that period. That was a, a lucky uh, call on your part. Um, 
well, that's that's the Gaps diet. Yeah. And I I consider Natasha Campbell McBride you know, one of my heroes. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, and I think she recommends in her book to start with very low dose of uh, kefir. Some people yes. say keep um, yes. like a tablespoon dose. Is that, yeah. is, that, is that what you did? You started with a small amount. Otherwise, um, you can have an, an adverse reaction. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, there's something about, about kefir or kefir um, that I learned recently. The work of uh, Richard Sprague, um, who's uh, one of those quantified individuals, uh, a kindred spirit of yours. He, he discovered that if you um, use your kefir grains, um, and my understanding is the best grains to buy are from goat farms. Would you agree with that? Is that? I think that's the traditional, the traditional method with, with goat okay. farms, for sure. Okay, but you, you buy the grains from the goat farm, and then you can use bovine milk to produce uh, uh, kefir. And, and yeah. um, well, you can use coconut. You could use coconut, you could use goat's milk, you could use bovine milk. It's, it's a very flexible yeah. culture. Yeah, but, but the actual uh, grain, my understanding is it's best um, originating from a goat farm. Um, I don't know if that's true. Um, oh, I, that, that, that's, a tif that's a difficult one because, I mean, you could use goat's milk to, to, to feed the grain, but... It, I, don't, I don't think it needs to originate from a particularly a coat farm. You just need to get it from okay. someone who has very strict, you know, food controls, handling, just to make okay. sure the culture is well-maintained and, and okay. not, with no contamination. And that's the main thing. Oh, interesting. Well, mm. here's, the, uh, here's the, the fairly new fact. Um, it's not published in a peer-reviewed journal, but... Yeah. Uh, as good as that. In fact, I don't even trust the, the peer review process. But, um, <laughs> but, but if you ferment the kefir for 24 hours, it will not be dominant in lactobacillus. It takes 48 hours fermentation for lactobacilli to become dominant. That's a powerful uh, thing to consider because some people are, you know, they, they may only ferment for 24 hours and that's not quite enough if they're if what they're going after is lactobacillus. Yeah. That, that, how, long you, how long were you fermenting? Your... For us, normally it's around 48 hours. I mean, the, the kefir is ready for consumption at, at 24 hours. But for, for what you're saying, essentially, Keith, is it's very easy to pick whether it's going to be high in lactobacillus because it's more sour, because lactobacilli produce lactic acid. So if you're having your kefir quite young, say at 24 hours, it's more bready and more yeasty. It's, it's most likely to be yeast dominated at that point. But as you, you ferment longer, and especially if you're fermenting anaerobically without oxygen, this is going to favor your lactobacilli and suppress your yeast. So you could potentially get a high lactobacillus content by fermenting with the lid closed essentially because it is oh. quite sour after 24 hours but if you use the i guess the typical method that people use which is a cloth over a jar aerobically with oxygen then what you're saying is is most likely to be correct interesting i like that you're bringing up oxygen because this relates to um, another way to consider balancing a body to create you know, an improved uh, chance of, of good mental health. And that is with fiber that, that feeds the butyrate producers. And then what happens is butyrate signals are colonocytes in the gut. Those are the cells of the epithelial lining of the gut. Um, it, the butyrate signals those cells to mop up oxygen. And it's the aerobes, the aerobic bacteria, um, that are mainly the gram-negative bacteria that can be the ones causing the problem. So that, might, that may be the mechanism behind a high-fiber diet being applied to you know, what's called neuroepigenetics um, and, um, and uh, you know, going after uh, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So without, without that fiber, what happens is um, there's not enough mucus generated in the gut lining for the microbes to live on and um, then the microbes have a they really have the free reign to start eating our cells 
Mm. So we need, we need to feed them fiber so that they don't eat us. <laughs> and, that, and that's actually um, part of uh, really what's happening in diabetes and celiac disease. Mm. Um, when the microbes are going through the mucus, mm. uh, the mucosal, and, uh, and they have direct access to, um, to our cells, which are really intimately um, associated with the, the vagus nerve. Uh, and because they're the, what's known as the afferent nerves there. And uh, that's a direct connection to the brain. Um, mm. And that's, that's taking place in, in the pyrus patches again. Yeah, that, that's, that's a fascinating insight. And, and, you know, if someone's listening to the podcast and they're kind of following whether it's a GAPS diet or whether it's a FODMAPS diet or they've got a sensitive gut, what I really recommend is looking at something like an acacia fiber or an or partially hydrolyzed guar gum. A, pa a past guest, Dr. Jason Horolak, is, is big on this as well, to, to boost your your and they're both, both these products are also FODMAP friendly, so they're not, they're not going to cause bloating or you know, discomfort in the gut, but it's a great way to introduce fiber into the gut to help feed those lactobacilli and those bifidobacteria, which are absolutely critical for mental health. So yeah, I think acacia fiber seems to be really safe. Um, yeah. The, the PHGG, however, the partially hydrolyzed war gum, I've, I've heard people say it caused a negative reaction for them. Okay. So you, have to, yeah. you have to be very careful with any prebiotic and start with very small doses to avoid yeah. adverse reaction. Things like inulin, for instance, are known to feed uh, proteobacteria um, like Klebsiella. Um, and um, so for certain uh, balances, even something that seems as healthy as inulin can cause problems. So, totally. And inulin can cause a substantial amount of bloating as well. You know, think, think about when you're having a lot, of, a lot of, like a soup or casserole with lots of, or curry or something like that with lots of onions. And that's really high in inulin and that can cause some substantial bloating. So again, wow. inulin could be really good to feed some good bacteria in the gut at the right amounts, but it can have some substantial adverse effects if your gut is sensitive and it comes back full circle to what you were talking about earlier. It's very much now a personalized regime. It's, a, it's personalized medicine. The microbiome is, is like a fingerprint. It's different for each person. So that's why it's great to experiment with your own, your own body and try different prebiotics and work, work out what works for you. Something works for one person might not necessarily work for others and might cause adverse reactions because there's so many yeah. different variables. Even, even uh, what is now known to be a very effective tool, fasting, a lot of people have an adverse reaction to fasting. Um, and you know, my theory is they have a gram negative overgrowth where fasting um, can, can cause problems. And um, someone who has a gram positive overgrowth might have a better chance of gaining benefits uh, by, by way of fasting. Mm. It's, it's so, you know, each person is different. Mm -hmm. And we're pretty, we're pretty much at time, Keith. So we'll start to, we'll have a couple more rapid fire questions and then we'll, we'll wrap okay. things up. Okay. So Keith, you've got this amazing group of people that are all fascinated about the microbiome the gut club and you've got the stool testing group as well and people are regularly posting so i encourage everyone to go and have a look at these groups and start to share because there's something special about citizen science isn't it i mean oh, yeah. you, know, you can you can go to a ubiome or you know, any of the numerous other stool testing companies and you know and you can share your results and have an open conversation with with people and you know and you facilitate that so beautifully so what's what's some of the common threads that you come across from people sharing their information oh you mean on the stool test discussion group that some of the yeah threads? absolutely hmm. well you know i'm moved in particular by 
the caregivers of children that um, that are having issues, you know, such as autism. Um, that's one of the common threads in our in our group, and um, the imbalance is, is pretty pretty stark. In fact, one of the first um, charts that I saw, it was like forty nine percent proteobacteria. Wow. And and the um, the mother's doctor didn't know how to interpret that, um, and uh, when she finally um, realized that this could be the problem, she was able to make an informed decision about what to do about it, and she chose fecal microbiota transplant, which wow. is FM FMT, yeah. and sure enough, that balanced the the uh, problem and attenuated autistic symptoms. Wow. And, yeah, people are also using probiotic enema to take care of that. I'm about to uh, launch a new project for the Gut Club. I call it the the um, breastfed baby poop project, mm -hmm. and that's that's uh, the uh, theory that breastfed baby poop, preferably unvaccinated, um, um, for various reasons because vaccines may shift flora. Um, but and 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 by the way, it's also the flora that are part that are that are there prior to vaccination um, that upon vaccination can alter the immune response. I call that microbial predisposition. Um, anyway, the, the breastfed baby poop project is about using breastfed baby poop um, as donor material. And whether it's pre-weaned or weaned makes a difference because pre-weaning the baby poop has very high levels of bif bifidobacteria, it can be 80 or even 90% bifidobacteria, and also high levels of the healthy phages that we talked about earlier. Um, but post weaning, uh, when solid food is introduced, that's when clostridia become dominant. And so if someone is, is needing high levels of butyrate producers, then that may be a, a better choice of donor material. So right now, this is theory. There aren't any uh, research papers published about this. But I have a hunch that baby poop might be the most important source of untapped medicine. Um, and so I, I think that will be interesting. And in fact, um, in the history of FMT in China, going back hundreds of years, maybe a 1,000 years, um, they were using infant stool um, and making the equivalent of a of a poo poo milkshake. It was it was used oral, oral. yeah. And, and these days, people are um, uh, using capsules. You have a more direct route to the small intestine, um, mm. as opposed to uh, the the rectal route to the, to the colon. Mm. Um, so, anyway, uh, what's another thread? I'm seeing a lot of of uh, people that have high bacteroides. I think that seems to be the the number one issue. Um, and what's happening, and the reason for that, it seems, is reduced levels of protective microbes. They're, they're, they have reduced or absent bifidobacteria, lactobacilli, and acromantia. Some people have very high levels of bifidobacteria, but no lactobacillus. And that's a big problem that, according to one paper, may implicate magnesium deficiency. They, it was shown that high levels of bifidobacteria uh, correlated with magnesium deficiency, as if they were trying to compensate for the inflammation. So you can have too much of a good thing. In fact, you can, we're also seeing very high levels of acromantia causing problems. You know, these are you know always you know usually considered uh, the the super superheroes of things like weight loss, mm -hmm. um, but you can have too much of a good thing. But all these things seem to go along with high levels of bacteroides and low butyrate producers, low clostridia. Um, and there are, few, there are a few cases that seem uh, to be the exception. And that might be people of Indian ancestry, um, possibly Spanish or, or Persian ancestry, mm -hmm. where, and, and possibly Africans as well. Uh, you know, Part of, the, part of the controversy 
regarding vaccine injury, in fact, is about high levels of, of risk in the African-American male community. African-American boys were shown to have increased risk of autism by the MMR vaccine, and no one's been able to explain it. Um, I think it may be about naturally high levels of gram-negative bacteria that guide the immune response. Um, and there are studies that show that, that being the case, that, that um, Africans and, and African-Americans and, and even females, um, uh, well, let's not get into that part of it, but, um, but these, these communities, uh, these, these races, um, let, let's put it this way. Flora balance is a matter of race, gender, and geography. Um, people are different. Uh, and again, I call it the underlying beauty of diversity. And, and so it's not a one size fits all program. Everyone's different. Everyone's going to have a different immune, immune response based on eons of interaction between bacteria and our immune system. And the bacteria are actually guiding our, our genetic expression and probably um, our genes themselves. They're definitely having, in, having an impact on mitochondrial function, which I know it's yeah. a subject we talked about. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're doing the backstroke in, in our cells um, and, and impacting mitochondria from the outside and the inside of mm -hmm. cells. Absolutely. And people, people, I think most people don't realize mitochondria based on, on the latest science are, are archaic bacteria themselves or, or remnant, remnants of archaic bacteria. They've yeah. essentially lost a lot of their genes, but they're endosymbiotic, mean, meaning they, they're now an organelle inside the cell, but they're very much bacteria in origin. So there's definitely right. communication happening. Right, and there's a school of thought that is not that large of a school yet, but I'd like to promote the idea that antibiotics may have their effect by way of how they're, they're um, causing mitochondria to release uh, ROS, reactive oxygen species, to balance the cell. It's not just about killing bacteria. It's about affecting microbes, in, I, I mean mitochondria. In fact, there's some studies in autism showing uh, how vancomycin, the, the antibiotic used to attenuate autistic symptoms, they think it's about lowering clostridia, and then when you stop, um, you know, using the antibiotic, the spores from clostridia are able to to grow back. It's a spore-forming bacteria, but that's yeah. not the way I view the the issue. I think it's about, and there are studies to back this way of thought that the um, the the antibiotic is affecting mitochondria, and and release of things like hydrogen hydrogen peroxide that can balance the cell and kill intracellular microbes that are causing the problem. That's a fascinating insight. Wow, I think we're, we're pretty much at time now, Keith, and we'll start okay. to wrap. So the, the question is, we always ask at the end of the show, if there was one thing, Keith, that a listener could do for their gut health today, what would it be? Well, you know, the most obvious thing would be to stop eating sugar. Um, that's a very powerful thing in and of itself, and maybe the hardest thing. Sugar addiction is so hard to uh, to tackle. I, I fight it. You know, I you know I'm uh, fifty. I'm almost fifty eight years old now, and I think for the first fifty years of my life, I ate enough breakfast cereal to sink a navy ship. <laughs> I was heading, heading down the wrong path. And I still uh, battle carbohydrate and sugar cravings. Um, but I know, based on my own experience, that when I stop eating that uh, for a month, it changes everything. It's mm -hmm. a very simple thing to do, to, to eliminate sugar, period. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, um, you know, from a mental health standpoint, you know, take a hike. <laughs> <You know? laughs> get, on, get on into the greenery. Get out into nature and uh, great advice. <laughs> yeah. 
James, anything, any questions? No, no, I, I think that was great. And I, I agree with getting out of nature as well. I think that's <laughs> super helpful. <laughs> it's so helpful. Yeah. And I think it's just, it's, it's, it's common sense. Spending more time in nature, eating clean, going to your farmer's market. Mm-hmm. You know, these are all the things that help transform my life. They're very simple, but pretty hard to put in practice. I, yeah. I well, getting, getting out in the sunshine itself mm-hmm. is known to raise vitamin D levels. Which, which balance microbes in the small intestine, which are the center, that's the center of all health. Uh, mm-hmm. The duodenum, uh, that, that's the, you know, the, the upper small intestine. That's how vitamin D does its job. Um, but it's not just about sunshine. Otherwise, we wouldn't have kids in Bangladesh, a million, by the million, having rickets when they're not wearing sunblock. Um, you know, it's, it's been shown that microbes regulate our vitamin D levels. So, you know, what's thought of as the sunshine vitamin really isn't about sunshine. Um, and probiotics are known to raise vitamin D levels. It so, just highlights, it. I mean, past, the past guest, Dr. Jack Cruz, he's a huge advocate of the sun. You can always go back and listen to some of the past episodes when he talks about, I guess, light and the microbiome. But I agree, Keith, it's, it's such a complex complex system the body you know all these these things that we don't typically associate with you know things like vitamin d Mm. this complex interactions and the microbiome seems to be this massive organ that's right in the front of regulating a lot of these hormones and vitamins enzymes Mm -hmm. that we need so 100 percent agree yes and with the sunshine also if if people ate a lot of dark leafy greens. Um, I like uh, watercress and arugula. Um, and there was a study that's very provocative. Um, the chlorophyll interacts with sunlight, and you end up, um, you know, when you're when you're in UVA light, which is late afternoon light, as opposed to UVB, which is when the sun is directly overhead. Um, you can raise nitric oxide levels through that interaction with UVB and chlorophyll. So have a, have a dark leafy green salad and take a hike in bright sunlight at 4 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's a, that's, a, that's a good way to wrap up. And, and Keith, huge gratitude for you coming onto the show. And it's great that, you know, at times we, we're not talking to university professors, but, you know, people who are really passionate about the microbiome, gut health, they're, they're hugely interested in you know f- waving the flag of you know protecting our environment so we we love to give people like yourself an opportunity and have a voice to to, mm. to have a have a conversation and, and put some some thought ideas and put some ideas out into the ethos and mm. for people to consider and keep an open mind about thank you you know but the fact that i'm not a uh, university pr- uh, professor or a research scientist even though i'm associated with some i just put out a a paper it's just been published uh, called Do Microbiota Mediate Adverse Vaccine Reaction? Um, the, um, the idea is because I'm not a, a, um, tied to a large organization, that gives me more potential for putting out some wild ideas um, mm-hmm. and uh, without the fear of jeopardizing my funding or being fired. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's such a good point. And, you know, if people want to, they're, they're resonating what you're saying, they've, they've had some stool testing done, they want to get involved with Keith Bell, how do they find you on the interwebs? Well, they can go to thegutclub.org, um, the Gut Club on Facebook, and the Gut Club stool test discussion group. Please join us. Everyone's invited. You don't have to have test results uh, to post. Um, but we look forward to everyone joining the conversation. Awesome. Highly encourage our listeners to go check out Keith's wonderful group. There's some very interesting and insightful discussions happening. Keith, thank you so much. Huge gratitude. Thank you. Same to you from 9,700 miles away from Palm, <laughs> from Palm Beach County with love. With love. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. <laughs>